it's Tommy Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com and this week we have the amazing Marcia Ball. Come check it out. Thank you for taking the time to sit in with me today. Glad to do it. And what's what's the weather like there right now in Texas? <clears throat> well, today uh, it will be almost ninety degrees Fahrenheit in October, October whatever fifteenth. But tomorrow it'll start going down into what we consider more fall weather, and it'll be it'll be kind of perfect. It'll be what I think of as Hawaii weather, you know, and the in the 70s and 80s here. Right. So, Blimey. Um, it's still lovely it's weather, not, though. It's not bad. And then it'll just be that way till Christmas time, at least. It's it's nice. The leaves are starting to fall a little bit. It's that, that time of year where you could <clears throat> wear a sweater in the morning and uh, get in the swimming pool in the evening. We're hitting highs of 13 or 14 here. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's usual weather for us. Yeah. Also, also, it hasn't rained in a while here. We could use some rain in Texas. Of course, in Louisiana, down home, they've had two hurricanes in a row, and everybody's reeling down there. It's been terrible, terrible. And um, But here we don't get – we haven't got any rain, but then we can look forward to – Biannual floods, usually one in May, late May, and, and then often one in late October. So you just, you know, <laughs> wait and see. Can you tell me about your journey when you, um, you, you, left, you left home and you saw your car broke down in Austin and you liked it that much that you decided to stay there? Yeah, it was. Uh, we were in Austin because we knew well because we knew people here, and because I had friends who had moved here before us, and there had always been this um, interaction between Austin and Baton Rouge. There were a lot of people going back and forth, and then there was the interaction between Austin and San Francisco. People going back and forth. So it was a, a really good link and, and interaction. So we stopped here because the guitar player from my band that I've been in in Baton Rouge, one had, there were two guitars, one moved to Austin and the other moved to San Francisco. And we were having Was that Frieda and the Fire Dogs? No, it was a band called Gum. It was a rock oh, and roll Oh, Gum, band. okay. And uh, so one guy moved here and the other moved to San Francisco. And my roommate from before I was married had also moved here. And uh, I had been here one time before to Austin and... Knew I loved it. It was really cool. And so when we stopped to visit and ended up staying longer than we thought we would because our Austin Healy Sprite <laughs> broke down. <laughs> we, um, by the time we could go on, we had just found that we liked the pace, the lifestyle, the opportunity, um, before you knew it, we had jobs at the university, both my husband and me, and um, we already had some friends here, and the it was not a big city. It was a small city with a big university and a state capital, that, so it was not, I'd come from kind of an industrial part of the country, and uh, the water was beautiful, and we just didn't need to go any farther. Well, I've read in a few books that it was the happening place. It was hip and, you know. Well, it's my friend Eddie Wilson who owned the Armadillo World Headquarters and Thread Mills, two iconic venues here in town, said uh, Austin was built on cold beer and cheap pot. Attractive in, in 1969-70. Yeah, and a great place for a musician. Yeah, it was um, 
it grew into that. You know, it, there was a music scene uh, in in the 60s and 50s. My husband, my current husband, who is my second husband, who grew up here, was a musician in the 50s here as a as a high school kid. But um, what later happened in the 70s was uh, was quite the uh, the explosion of uh, you know it had a lot to do with Willie Nelson moving here. Um, had a lot to do with the all the hippies uh, deciding to reclaim first to reclaim country music. They um, and and that was built on the Birds, Sweethearts of the Rodeo, uh, the band on Graham Parsons, on um, a few things like that. That, that. that we who grew up liking country music had had to cede it to the to the rednecks. And we just said, well, hell, you know, we can, we have the jeans, we have our boots, we have hats, we can, we can play, and we like this music, we're taking it back. And so we did. <laughs> and it created, you know, by that, at that point, Willie came to town, Asleep at the Wheel came to town, Jerry Jeff Walker came to town, um, Michael Martin Murphy, it, it just became this incredible scene. And then countless other musicians, bands from all over. Sean Colvin came here with a band from Indiana called the Dixie Diesels, and people came from Ann Arbor, and people came from the Boston area, and then all the Texas people, all the guitar players from Dallas came down. Stevie Vaughan, Jimmy Vaughan, Denny Freeman, um, the the drummers, um, Doyle Bramhall and, and Roddy Colonna, the Lubbock guys, the songwriters, Joe Ely, Butch Hancock, Jimmy Gilmore, all came to Austin. And when was that, in the 70s? Pretty, pretty glorious, yes. Yeah, okay. And it was cheap. As it, rent was cheap. <laughs> Not just pot, rent was cheap too. And, Anto and Antones, was that started up in the 70s? Antones opened in 1975. The Armadillo World Headquarters was really the the first headquarters of this, and it opened in 70. So Creek Saloon, which is not as well known as either of those other places, was enormously influential, and they opened in about 73. And they had the meters. They had Professor Longhair. It was where Doug Som, it was Doug Som's home base. It was where um, Delbert played. At, uh, at Soap Creek, it was where the Cobras played every Wednesday night and uh, Cobra night with Stevie on rhythm guitar, Denny Freeman on lead. Um, the Thunderbirds cut their teeth there. There was another club called uh, The One Night that, um, that all these bands also played, kind of the blues band, but everybody played all those places. When did you meet Delbert the first time? Would have been at Soap Creek in the in the early seventies or mid seventies, and uh, um, there's a his 80th birthday is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. And we're supposed to all do a video, like send a video hug. And I've been thinking about what I was going to say, and and I'll never forget that first night that I saw him because I was. Playing country music, hippie country music in Austin, but my heart and my mind and my music was still back in Louisiana. And he was the first artist that I saw in Texas who was playing that music of my childhood, of my growing up, and of my what I really wanted to do. And it was like I was given permission to... Um, to play that music, to, to embrace what I grew up with. I heard um, the duet you done together. It sounded lovely. Um, I didn't know, when did you record that one? Is that on an album or? Is that, um, You Make It Hard? Yeah, it was a ballad. Yeah, that's an Alan Toussaint song and that is on maybe the Let Me Play With Your Poodle record. I have a, I have a document with all that on it. But. Yeah, because I was reading his book, and he obviously he's from Texas, so I wondered if he stayed in Texas, but obviously he's moved out of the area then. Yeah, he he, grew, he was in Fort Worth. I mean, Fort Worth has been crazy 
how many amazing musicians they have sent out to the world. A lot of them moved to uh, L.A., I guess in the 70s, and um, the ones who didn't come to Austin went to L.A. and became studio musicians, and a lot of them went to the college in North Texas called, uh, uh, well, it was North Texas State at the time, in Denver, and it was a famous jazz school. Their, their jazz band would be uh, where band leaders like Woody Herman would come and famously recruit students to go on the road with them. So. Yeah. Did you, um, what was your meetings with Stevie Ray Vaughan like? Yeah, I knew Stevie. Um, I used to go see the, the Cobras. I guess when I first met him, he was playing with the Cobras at Soap Creek. And, um, and Lou Ann Barton. And Lou Ann. Oh, there was another club called Roll Men. The Roll Men, uh, where Lou Ann and, and Stevie played a lot. And that was a that was a good hang, just a little club, corner corner bar. Um, but that was one of his after he became Stevie Vaughan, but before he became Stevie Ray, um, that was kind of his home. And uh, yeah, Lou Ann and I are still close. Yeah, because you done you done a, 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 a some work together with Lou Ann, didn't you? Dreams come true. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. One of my favorite projects, Lou Ann and Angela Australia. Yeah, was that a live one? No, no, we actually it took about five or more years to finish that record. It was all studio work. It's called Dreams Come True because somebody at the record company said, if we ever finish this record, it's going to be a dream come true. <laughs> so, so I thought, well, I can write that song. So I wrote a song called Dream come, Dreams Come True. It was produced by Dr. John. Oh, okay. Kind of, you have to look at the, the credits, uh, you know, ha actually have the record in hand to, to see that uh, Mac produced it. And so getting Angela Lou, me, Sarah Brown, and, and uh, Mac Rabinac together was not an easy thing at any given time. So we recorded over years. Jimmy Vaughn is on that. Um, it's, it's got an all-star band, Derek O'Brien. All original songs? Oh, no. No. Um, I have one on there. I think I have two on there. Uh, but um, no, there are a lot of covers. We we covered uh, several Etta songs, like um, "Something's Got a Hold on Me" is one of the songs we did, and um, yeah, mostly covers. In fact, one of I, I found a, a song from down in Louisiana, and I can't I can't remember who did it. You know, I've got a lot of great vinyl, and I would pull out either a 45, you know, just dig through and see, or in this case, it was a compilation record of New Orleans stuff. And there's a great song that I love. One of my favorites on that record is called You Can If You Think You Can. And, and, uh, and we, we covered that. It was mostly covers, I think. Oh, and I, I sang a Lavelle White song. I sang I'm Gonna Make It This Time, which was cool. And uh, and that's the first time I met Lavelle. Do you still... um? get goosebumps from music, like new music you hear? I do. I do. Kind of interesting. My two, I've got three things in my car right now that I listen to a lot that I've just gotten. One is the Mavericks um, new record, which is in Spanish. The other, and I don't even know if this is out yet, but Terrence Simeon, the Zydeco Creole guy in uh, Lafayette, has a new record out called Ancestral Grooves, where he went down to New Orleans and worked with James Andrews, who's trombone shorty's older brother, and um, Roger Lewis from the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, and, and I guess some of those other guys, and his band, and they did this amalgam of the grooves of both New Orleans and the Bayou Country, and it's a lot in French. His daughter Marcelina is singing with him on some of it, I just love it. I just love it. And then the other one is that my former son-in-law, in the middle of all this, had been working on a record for a while. His name is Matt Giles, G-I-L-E-S, and he has made a record called Year of the Dog that I love. So those three records are in my car. I actually still have a CD player in my car. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe your music? Indescribable. It's uh, it's based in musically. It's based in Gulf Coast rhythm and blues. 
the classic styles of Louisiana, Texas, both Gulf Coast. Um, lyrically, I'm more influenced by my years in Austin, my experience in Austin where songwriting mattered, lyrics mattered, storytelling mattered, and so matters. So I'm, um, I'm some combination of the two thing, two places that I've lived my life. So what do I call that? Do you have a method to your writing? Well, to sit down and do it, there's always something percolating. I'm always making notes. I'm always eavesdropping. I'm always thinking of, of wordplay um, and situations. But the actual making of a song is more in... in even in a lockdown, <laughs> even unemployed and locked down, I still stay too busy. So to get myself to just sit down at the piano and make a song is the challenge. But I've done it a few times since all this started. And I can tell when I'm about to be creative because all of a sudden everything everybody says or many things become, oh, yeah, I'm going to write that down. I'm gonna, that's a hook. So if I start doing that, I know I'm on the verge of, of getting some songs. And what comes first for you? Do you write them both at the same time? Yeah, it, it's a mixed bag. And um, sometimes I'll sit down and start feeling a groove and, and write to the groove. And sometimes I have a phrase that dictates the rhythm and that, that sets up the, the writing, the pattern. Do you have a song that you're most proud of? Um, that is the one that stayed in your set for a long, a long time. There's some that actually are not in my set and haven't been in a long time that I'm, that I'm actually more proud of. Probably, um, there are a lot of ballads that I've written that I'm, uh, I think are worthy. One of my favorites is "She's So Innocent," which is really a, a jazzy little ballad. I'm, I'm happy with, actually, on this most recent record, uh, Shine Bright, because I wanted to say exactly that, you know, in, uh, urge urge people to perform acts of good, randomly go out there and be good in, in response to whatever else is going on. Uh, I got to list some of my heroes, and it varies from night to night in performance to performance, so... I, uh, I'm proud of that. Um, I have written a lot of funny, silly songs that, um, that I, I think are good. One is, um, Baby Why Not, which is a, a story song that's, uh, that's got some of my better wordplay, some of my favorite lines. <laughs> that I've written. How much has the uh, music industry changed, would you say, over the years you've been, <laughs> you've been in the business now? It's gone. It's, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, somehow they figured out how to um, not pay musicians again. Somehow it's all free. And um, I, I worry. That's another thing about being on this end of my career that's, uh, I worry about the the next generation and how they're going to figure out how to get paid for their creative output. Because what are you going to do? I've got friends who have been successful songwriters for decades, who raised families and supported themselves. That is gone. That is gone. And people are writing their own songs a lot. Of, that's the good part. The the on the plus side. The songwriter mills are probably not as active because people are actually performing the songs they're writing themselves. On the other hand, if you write a song and put it out anywhere, which people do, you just don't get any money for it. And there's lip service being paid to how that could improve, but so far nobody's really taken it up seriously. And now, with all this, um, 
lockdown and no live music and no telling what's going to be left for us when the uh, when this is over. What people are going to, how people are going to both put it out there and how they're going to go get it. We're talking about it. They want to open bars here now. And I'm thinking of all the things we need to open up and need to do. And as much as I sympathize with the service industry, bars are not high on my list. Going and standing around drinking is not, to me, urgent. I think that maybe schools, <laughs> we need more school teachers. Maybe, maybe we could retrain these bartenders. Just <laughs> but with the likes of Spotify, then you, you're thinking the, the low 0.0002p or whatever per stream. I think it's larceny. And, uh, you know, when you see yourself on, on YouTube, somebody's put you on YouTube, not you, somebody else, and there are two commercials before your video. And you think, well, wait, who gets that money? It's not me. So, yeah, I don't even, my protest is so serious, I don't do Spotify or, or the other ones. I just, I don't do it. I buy CDs. I am just a old, old schooler. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? <laughs> um, years ago, I've got two to share, and they're both kind of funny. Uh, Years ago, I had a guitar player, a legendary Austin guitar player named Bill Campbell, who said, I'm telling you, Slinky, if you can make them dance, money will become a space problem. <laughs> so, so all these years, I've been trying to make them dance. <laughs> and what was the other one? Well, the other one is something that somebody asked Delbert one time, what uh, if he had any advice for you know young musician. And he said, yeah. Never leave your wallet backstage. <laughs> so, neither of those are all that serious, except that making them dance has worked for me. And what I can do is do a song with a message like Shine Bright or, or Pots and Pans or something and set it to a beat or, or the squeeze is on and set it to a beat. And in the middle of all that dancing, you think, wait a minute now. There was a, there was a serious idea in there. So... That's that's how we do it. If you could have three wishes, what would you wish for? Um, the end of this um, horrible pandemic. Um, a more just and fair and empathetic world overall. And... and um, more wishes. That's right. <laughs> I'm, not asking, I'm not asking for a lot here. <laughs> world, world peace and uh, health for all of humanity and, 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 and some attention to, to climate change. Big picture. The big picture. If you could go back in time and experience any like day again in history, what would you choose? One of those days would be the Barack Obama's election day. That was uh, that was great, and it, it portended it, it. It led us to eight years of um, a world, you know, a better a better world, not a perfect world, but definitely hope, which is what he promised was hope. So that was a that was a great night. What was your encounter with uh, Clint Eastwood? I saw that you'd done a, a bit in that documentary. Yeah. Uh, they were doing that big um, music series, the Martin Scorsese um, directed series, and um, they put Clint Eastwood on the piano because he is a piano player, and, and so he got that segment, and he did a wonderful job. It was everybody, all the different directors did... Um, they're very much a point of view sort of a thing. Eastwood um, let the piano players speak for themselves pretty much, and it was great. So we had played the Monterey Blues Festival that day. Um, 
if we had played the night before up north of the Bay Area somewhere, short night, early morning, early sound check, and if you drive down to Monterey, do our early sound check, sit around, play two sets, one in the afternoon, one in the early evening, and then I was picked up by the driver and taken to Carmel to, to Eastwood studio. I was a fried potato chip. I was I was like a zombie. And from the minute and I and I walked in, I looked a lot like I did earlier today. And from the minute I walked into the barn that was his studio, the cameras were on. No prep, no lipstick, no would you like to freshen up? You need a glass of water. It's like, here you are. So, and then when I got there, Pine Top Perkins and um, Jay McShann were already there. So just up the <laughs> the intimidation factor to about eyeballs. And um, it was something plus Eastwood. So it was what it was. Um, he was a, easy. He's easy to be around. He's definitely a fan of the music, so. I noticed that you've clocked up quite a few awards as well. Um, I, was, yes, I, I, I was trying to write them out and there were so many of them. So, I was wondering about, you want to see some jump? Here's some jump, wait a minute. <laughs> Those are Blues Awards. Yeah. There's uh, Angela and Luann. And uh, Sarah Brown. No, that's Angela and Luann and me. That's, that's that picture. And uh, there's UB Blake on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> take you all, I'll take you on a tour. And you got introduced into the Austin Music Hall of Fame in 2018. How was that? It was the Austin City Limits Music Hall. The Austin City Limits Hall of Fame. Okay. The Austin Music Hall of Fame, which started back in the 90s or maybe even before, I was, I was in that one of the first years. Um, but recent, the Austin City Limits Hall of Fame was, this, uh, was in 18. Yeah, it was great. They, they do a big show every year uh, to induct people, and they always ask really headliner special guests and so they asked me who I wanted to be on with me and and I immediately answered Irma Thomas and she graciously agreed to and so and then Tracy Nelson because that's the other group record that I did uh, Angela and Luann and me and then Tracy and Irma and um so they were there, plus my two contemporaries, actually, they're my inspirations. My, my, they're the ones who push me along now, Shelley King and Carolyn Wonderland here in Austin, who now we do things together. So I had all of them. I had, I had this enormous cushion of voices and hearts there with me to, to celebrate what was a lot of fun. And then they had... Um, Nora Jones on and as part of the Ray Charles segment. It was really, really cool. It, it must be uh, lovely as well because you've stuck with Irma for quite a number of years now, haven't you? It's friendships. And you first saw her when you was, was it 13? I was. I was a kid. My grandmother lived in New Orleans, one of my grandmothers. And um, we were there a lot in the summer and vacations and holidays and... Um, my cousin, my, who's my age, somehow we got permission to go to this big show. And uh, it was one of those New Orleans package shows that I'm sure must have had Ernie Cato and Benny Spellman and Lee Dorsey and everybody on it because it was a long show and that's who was, those were the hit makers. But I remember Irma. I was just blown away by Irma. For a lot of reasons. But it must be lovely to come back and then work with work with her through the years. And oh, it was great. It was great. I met her again. I met her in 1975 for the first time, really, to meet her at one of her gigs. And um, then a 
couple of years, a few years later, we were interviewed together in New Orleans uh, for a magazine and, you know, sitting side by side and talking. And then we just stayed and visited for a long, you know, for a while after that. And that's when I feel like I got to know her. And she's just so real. She's so gracious and so, uh, I mean, not, you asked who gave me good advice. And I, I told you a couple of funny things, but but without actually ever saying a word or speaking to me about, you know, do this or do that, I have followed Irma Thomas. I followed Irma Thomas's life and her her performances and her 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 personality, her her way of being, and that has been probably the best guide. That I've had, and she did. You know, she chose the best material because she had all that Alan Toussaint stuff, and um, but she still does. Even you know, even now, she makes great records. If you could change anything about the music business, what would you change? I would have people get paid for their output for their music. Um, I think there are a lot more women. It's like a, a lot of. Um, industries where women are not it's not balanced as well as it should be women are still unfortunately kind of a novelty act in a lot of like festivals you see um and there are a lot of there are a lot of women who deserve more exposure than they're getting um i'm not sure why except that and I, i'm in the blues industry you know so uh and the blues is based on guitar Wanking, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you start playing. I don't disagree. <laughs> so, so, and and that's disproportionately uh, a, a man's guy thing. So, <clears throat> I'd like to see a little bit more balance in in uh, in gender is it, it exposure in in the music industry. Right. Okay. And what would you feel about people videoing you and put it on YouTube? You know, at festivals or gigs? You know, I don't... There's not much you can do about it. Everybody's got a video camera now. You know, their telephone. You can't really stop it. Um, so... So you're cool with it, though. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a person who says you can't do this or that. No, because I think there's uh, some people that have got someone that watches, and when they see phones come out, they go over and... like. Look, Tell them there to put it away. Of, a lot of people like that, but they're they're not probably people <clears throat> who are building a career exactly. You know that they're they're people who might feel like they're they're there and they don't want people to exploit them. But many musicians are hoping, you know, or please exploit me. <laughs> put, <laughs> please put my video on YouTube and. And the more the more watches, the better. What advice would you give a younger you now? Like you said, your son-in-law is a musician. What 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 do you give him with the industry? Well, I tell you, a lot. Of, they don't need my advice. I've met with um, there's a, a group of women here in Austin who meet, and they are um, they're younger for the most part than me. It was kind of formed by. There are about three of us who are from the generation, my generation, and then on through. And they are knowledgeable, and they are hip to all the social media platforms. They're hip to production in a way that we never were. Um, they're, in some cases, because I had a, I had an interesting time. You know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a mother. I, I was a single mother for a while. And... Um, but I also was very fortunate in that I was also not a single mother for a long time. And I had, um, even then, um, family to help. And, and that and that's difficult. And, and um, it's not a choice that anybody wants to make. Um, and if you are a, a working mother in any field, you live with guilt. And you have to, you have to deal with that. And what I do tell them, what I do know, my personal experience is that 
And I had to write this and put it on a note on my refrigerator that said, it's okay to work. Because I would have had to work at something. I would have been gone to a job for eight or nine hours a day, no matter what I did. So if it happens to be music that you're pursuing, it's still okay to work. That's the advice I give, I guess. But otherwise, when I left that first meeting, I said, if anybody needs to know how things used to be, you can call me. But otherwise, they're, they're rocking, literally and, and creatively. And what, do they help all musicians or are they? Yeah, this was a, a, a gathering of, of, and there were probably 18 women at this, this little get together. What's your Desert Island disc? Etta James Peaches. Peaches. It's a double LP. They never put it out as such on, uh, on, a, on a CD. The band, Big Pink or the second record, you only asked for one, but I'm getting more. Um, that Jerry Lee Lewis Mercury record with, um, she even woke me up to say goodbye on it and slipping around. Something by Ray Charles, something by Ray Charles. Do you listen to any podcasts or radio? I do a little bit. I do. We have some good radio stations here. We've got several good radio stations here. So um, I, do, I do get ever so slightly uh, more uh, exposure to more current stuff, but not really. What's your top radio show then you listen to? If I, my radio is often on a, a station here called Sun Radio, and uh, a woman named Susanna Schaffel does a midday show that it's just a mixed bag of, uh, of new and old. And uh, I'll tell you, um, acts, an act that I really like, well, there, there are a couple uh, that are not ancient or dead. Um, <laughs> but um, there's a, a duo called The War and Treaty that are amazing. And there's a group in New Orleans that everybody, most people know now, Tank and the Bangles, which is, uh, they're, they're great. She's wonderful. During your lockdown, what TV have you been watching? I don't, I don't binge too much. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not a sitter. So I, um, I read more and, um, uh, and I watched a little too much news late at night, but I'm not, a, I don't do a lot of it. I have watched a little bit and everybody, I've got to tell you, everybody over here loves BritBox. I don't know if y'all even know that, that by name, but here, you know, there's all that stuff that people are watching um, these days. The great British baking show is um, big and uh, a place to call home is a series everybody's watching. And so... I dip in every once in a while. Yeah, I'll tell you one show I like, and I don't even know where it comes from. My, my husband finds it on YouTube. <clears throat> it's one of those house hunter shows where this couple is going around and they're trying to find a, another place to live. And it's in, in Great Britain, and they're um, they're going. They're typically moving from the from the city out to the countryside. It is gorgeous, and you get to see all these cool houses and the scenery is. Gorgeous. So it's a little bit of, I, if I'm going to watch anything, and I watch, okay, here you go. I've been watching um, a series called The Chef's Table, which is all about food, and they travel. I mean, they've got a whole series in France. They've got a series in Italy. They did a whole series on barbecue, and um, that's another case where the, um, the scenery is beautifully shot. What books are you reading right now? I'm reading a book right now called People of the Book by Geraldine, what's her name? Um, and it's been out, it's, it's been out quite a while, um, but I just found it very uh, cool. Um, what is her name? Geraldine Brooks. 
I'm about to read a book called The Vanishing Half, which is set in Louisiana. I've been reading some books by um, Latin writers because I'm in a book club and, and we were going in that direction. So I just read one. These are not new books, by the way. Um, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent is one. And The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde by uh, Juno Diaz. Uh, and the book that's sweeping the area around here is a book called Becoming Duchess Goldblatt. And that writer is oh anonymous because it's supposed to be a created character. So And everybody I know is reading that. I read um, several different mystery series books as they come out. I read Transatlantic by Colin McCann. Oh, that was great. I don't know. I read, you know, I, I read a lot of books. Do you, you do it all on your phone or do you read actual books? I do, but actually I'm, I can, I'm pretty much on my iPad a lot for a lot of reasons. You know, you can take it to bed with you and you don't have to, if you don't live alone, if you have somebody sleeping over there, you don't have to turn on a light. You can read on your iPad. But come with me. Let's go. Anybody ever take you on a tour on these? Not yet. Things? This will be the first, Marcia. Let's do it. Okay, we're done. Let's turn on the light here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Books. Yep. And piano. Oh, wow. What's the first thing you learned on the piano? Well, I started taking piano lessons about the same time I started school when I was a kid. So, um, I mean, blues stuff, though. When was the first sort of bluesy? Was it left well, hand? My grandmother played ragtime piano, like stride. And my aunt played popular music like from the 40s and 50s so and so she could do a, little, a bit of a boogie woogie and that's uh, you know early on besides taking my little piano lessons I was uh, really trying to boogie trying to stretch my little fingers so I could make an octave so I could walk the bass um what is a can you show me a stride what is what stride is uh concert but no 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 just curious how that what the stride because obviously i've heard of barrel house and boogie and all the other ones well they've got all the different names you know for all that different stuff but that that's one name for stride could be also called barrel house we right. had some great barrel house piano players here by the way we had we used to do a show where we traveled around and i was kind of the moderator of the the mc and um the the 12th Street Rag was written by a Texan, Uday Bowman. And uh, so we talked about that. But the, we had a guy named Gray Ghost who, at the time, and this would have been in the 90s, he would be, he was in his 90s. And um, Gray Ghost, we had uh, Irby Bowser, we had a great piano player, Robert Shaw, uh, here in Austin. Um, we had a, a guy named Levada Durst. We had all these. And we and Margaret Wright and um, God, um, you know these players of the of that generation who came up when that kind of music was current and over that into my life here. So I got to play with them or see them. And so who's great. the earliest like blues piano guy? Like who would have been like the Blind Lemon Jefferson version for piano or the Robert Johnson? You know back then. Yeah. Um, 
Because I've heard of a lady called Winfred Hatwell, but I don't know what year she was. Yeah, I don't either. No. I've got some uh, recordings from the 30s. Of course, you know, they, the it, piano was the the instrument that was it, before the guitar. Um, because of the piano, Pine Top Perkins said he started out playing guitar, All right. but he moved, he moved to the piano because um, the um, piano would drown out the guitar. Before there was an electric guitar, you know, the piano was the loudest thing in the room. It was the whole orchestra in a box anyway. So you could get a lot, a lot more music out of it and be, and be heard better. So, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm not a great musical historian um, off the cuff, but I, there there were Texas. They called them um, well, the Barrel House players because they would uh, play in that kind of tavern with whiskey by the barrel. And there were there's a record of Texas Seaport piano players um, that from from around there, and then there were you know just basically. The ones in the the, the, the whorehouse piano players. <laughs> do you still enjoy writing songs? Do you still? I do. I do. It's kind of a great release, and it's a great way to express myself. And uh, it's been, like I said, because of being in Austin, where there's so many great writers, not just songwriters, but writer writers. Uh, the bar for we're telling a story is is pretty high. And then, of course, we got the the great storytelling songwriters like um, James McMurtry and uh, Butch Hancock and people who really spin a yarn. Ray Wiley Hubbard tells great stories. Jerry Jeff tells great stories. Guy Clark. You yeah. know, so there was a lot of, of real literature set to music. For a long time, and has been. It still is. Still, that's the thing about Austin is that, in spite of everything that's gone on in uh, in the music business, there's still a great creative energy in Austin. Do you um when you're writing songs, do you write more than you need and then edit? I have a lot of songs I've not recorded. Yes. No, I mean, do you but write I, more? Uh, I know. I know what you're yeah, saying, yeah. and uh, you know. The last couple of records I've written, honestly, I uh, it's almost like I'm writing on demand. You know, you're going to make a record, so you better get yourself 10 good songs. And I sit down and, and go, but you know, that what happens is, if they don't make the cut, I usually kind of know about it before I even finish the song. And so... I But at, lately, of course, since there's not any guarantee that you'll that there's any reason to make a record. I I, um, I write just for the sake of writing. I like to get it down, to get it out there. Do you find it hard to write about personal stuff or do you, you know, do you make fictional people up when you're writing or? I make people up a lot. And, um, and I'm not, um, I d I've had such a blessed life, knock on wood, that, um, and it's just kind of in my nature, I, I don't have a lot of angst. Uh, I'm not expressing a lot of heartache. I have songs that do. I have written those songs in the past. One of people's favorites that I, <clears throat> that I wrote is called Find Another Fool. And uh, it's, a, it's a heartbreak song. Why Women Cry is a heartbreak song. Um, For the Love of a Man is a heartbreak song. Um, but those are not the songs that people, 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 they want to hear me do La Ti Da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the, the fun ones. And when, when you was back being a single mum, how many songs would you say you got down in that time? You know, I didn't write that much at that time. I was just really starting out in the, in the, uh, my son was born in 1975. And um, and I started my own band that year. I'd been in the in the Fire Dogs before that. That whole summer was when I had to decide whether to be in a band, join a band, start a band, or figure out something else to do with my life. And I decided to start a band. And for about the next five years, I 
did a little bit of what I had been doing, which was the progressive country thing, and a little bit of what I was going to be doing, which was the Gold Coast rhythm and blues style. It was all mixed up in there. And I had great bands. I had a couple of really, really good groups of musicians. Uh, and we were, we were good bands that never got recorded. So by 1980, when I went completely into R&B, I really had not been writing that much. It was really more in, in the early 80s. And particularly, I wrote two songs on the Soul to Dress record, my first round of record. Only one song on Hot Mother Baby. And then the next record, which was Gator Rhythms, I wrote seven of the ten. And that was the first time that I most of the material on a record. And those songs are still some of people's favorite songs that I do. That's for Lottie Da and uh, Mama's Cooking and Daddy's Said and the power of love and uh, all came from. And what year would have that been? Around 83. Yeah, Hot Tamale. Um. Hot Tamale Baby. That one I wrote a few songs on, but that's a good... Uh, I was looking for songs for that record, and I have a friend in New Orleans named Jeff Honish who has written two or three definitive histories of New Orleans music. The first one's called I Hear You Knocking. He writes under the name Almost Slim. And uh, he has an amazing record collection. And I went to his house and dug through his 45s and found most of the songs on the Hot Tamale Baby record, like maybe nine out of ten. And I still needed one more song to complete the record. And I knew I wanted an upbeat Zydeco kind of a song. And I was trying to write one, not getting it. So I went back to his house and I went straight to the Clifton Chenier section of his 45s and started pulling out 45s. And when I pulled out Hot Tamale Baby, I said, I hope I like this song because this is the title to this could be the title song to our record. So I hope it's good. And I put it on and loved it. And nobody at that time was doing that song, including Clifton. So I got to tell him, I got to see him at Antones not long after the record came out. And I told him that I had recorded his song that I had named the record after his song and that I had dedicated the record to him. And he said, oh, he said, I forgot about that song. <laughs> and he went out that night and played it. And, yeah, and, and kept it, you know, kept it going from then on. <laughs> what drove you at that time, if you had a young child and being a parent and, and gigging, all that stuff, what was your drive? What was your, what was your goal? Well, like I said, Mama had to work. <laughs> so at that time, it was, it was like a work, it just... Well, you know, it, it was my job. It was also the thing I love to do. I love to travel. I'm really perfectly suited for, for what I've been able to do and, and been fortunate enough to do because I love to travel. It's taken me all over the world. I love to meet people. I, I get out. I love to play music. I've enjoyed writing. I've always had a team with me. I've always had a band of people who were supportive and, you know, in more, to more or less <laughs> degree, but especially over the last probably, you know, 20 or even 30 years, people who have worked together and, and always been uh, supportive of, of me and of each other. And after a while, basically, it also was part of my job to make sure that those other people, that, that the band had work and had income. So at some point, if you're going to be a, a lifelong musician, you also become a business person. Once again, to more, a better or, or a greater or lesser degree. And, uh, or you find somebody to help you out. And uh, so I've been lucky that way, but it was just, uh, it's what I, after you've done it a while, it becomes what you do. And 
I was I was granted permission as a five year old when they put me in piano lessons and and I got to watch my grandmother and my aunt play piano. They, it was I was given permission to do this. Did you ever set yourself goals, like targets to aim for, like get a record deal, no. get a do an album? Um. Well, you know, yeah, you have to do that. You have to make a plan so that you have a, a certain amount of creative output. Yeah. Um, I've just been more someone whose um, life has has taken a turn when I needed it, and and uh, some of those are hard. You know, I've had people I've worked with. I had I've had several agents in my life, and sometimes you get to kind of the end of the road with somebody, and and um, and you, or, or a record label even, you know, I've, I've, I've only been on three record labels plus the little Antones record one project thing that we did. But, you know, there was a point at which I left Rounder, which is still a wonderful group and, and the people were all friends and, and I love them, but I moved from them and it wasn't that I changed so much. Everybody changes. And I went with Alligator and Alligator has been it was what I needed to do at the time. So it's not, I'm not a goal person like next year at this time, I will have done this. So your Shine Bright album, for people wanting to get it and purchase it, what would be the best way, through your website or? Yeah, although, uh, honestly, I'll tell you the, uh, a sad story. The guy who has done my website since the very beginning. The guy who came to me in whatever, 1990 or whenever this all came about and said, there is such a thing as a website and you need one and I'll do it for you, passed away about a month ago. And I am really, um, right now it's sitting there and um, I'm, I'm in the process of... Um, finding someone to help me to figure out how to keep it going and or redo what we have to do. But I'm still I'm still in shock honestly about the about this whole event. So <laughs> so um but yes, um that's what I, and and I think that we're still able to retrieve if somebody did go there they would be able to uh, contact us, uh, there's uh, a place you can write to us through there called Gated Grounds, and you can uh, you can go through there. And I guess maybe for the time being, uh, my band page uh, on Facebook, the Marshall Ball band page, might be the the thing to do it. And <clears throat> we're doing right now. I, I'm involved in several nonprofits over here. Everybody is. Everybody's doing good work, but. Um, the uh, two of them here in Austin, one is called HAM, which is Health Alliance for Austin Musicians. And uh, it gets, because we don't have universal health care, we, um, we have to help our musicians um, try to get coverage. And they're a wonderful organization. They've been around about 15 years. And then uh, the other is a, a grassroots group that I'm one of the founders of called HOME. And we're paying rent for older musicians in town who, after a while, you don't get as much work, you don't have a safety net, and um, you might have health problems, and so we're doing that. So we're working on a big fundraiser right now for home. Um, so, and we all, have, there's Facebook about that. A lot of what you'll see on my Facebook page right now is um, how to hook up, and we're gonna do a wonderful video uh, virtual fundraiser <clears throat> around our Thanksgiving, which is November. It'll be on November 27th, the day after our Thanksgiving here. And uh, Ruthie Foster and <clears throat> Jimmy Vaughn and Lucinda Williams and John Mayall and Roel Mallow and Mark Bruce Arbor and, and a bunch of us, there's a bunch of the people on our board are musicians like Carolyn Wonderland and Shelley King and Jay Milano and um, Sarah Brown. We're all going to have videos, and it's going to be about food. We're also going to have the, it's going to be called home cooking for the holidays. So we'll be talking about food. So in, in addition to the tour you just got here, 
You'll get to see my kitchen. All right, you're going to be cooking. I'll be cooking. <laughs> What's your favorite meal then? Well, hmm, I don't know. One of the things I do really well is gumbo, being from Louisiana. Oh, okay, okay. The gumbo and etouffee and red beans and rice and all that good stuff. Right, okay. Um, we like uh, Thai food, my husband and I, uh, and play, we play with Thai food quite a bit. We are learning how to do that. Okay. He's a great cook. He just will look up something in a in a cookbook and, and we'll do that. You're not going down the plant plant based diet or plant based eating. The what? The plant based eating, which is just nof nothing but. Pl oh no, <laughs> <laughs> no! I'm a, I'm a Cajun. I eat everything. <laughs> I have friends who do. I have a I have a cousin by marriage who lost two hundred pounds. What are they doing to lose that? Plant based. Oh, plant based. Started out, you know, started out just trying to not be, um, you know, just trying to typically just take a, a diet or lose weight or what small portions or less meat or whatever. But now he's a total uh, plant based advocate and and a and a really, you know, a jock, a runner and everything. It's amazing. He was a football player. And he was, you know, and he was big anyway as a football player, but now he's, now he's a runner. So I'll just ask you a few quick fire questions. Pick one. So groove or melody? Groove. Hot chocolate or coffee? Oh, coffee. <laughs> I know what you're going to answer to this. Books or movies? Books. Singing or dancing? Well, I'm a singer, but I love to dance. Comedy or drama? Comedy. But especially, especially now. <laughs> Fats Domino or Professor Longhair? Oh, God. You, that's not fair. You can't do that. <laughs> Those are my guys. Those are my guys. Thank you for your time, Marcia. Okay. <laughs> Hey, it's Tommy Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com and that was Marcia Ball. You can find out more about her and her music at MarciaBall.com. Next week, we have Will Wild. Come check that out right here at Tommy Allen Music, 7 p.m. every Wednesday. Please give us a like, hit the subscribe button. Until next week, a word from our director. <sighs> Goodbye.